The next speaker is Dr. Sada Mire, who is the Director of Tourism for Somaliland and the Executive Director of Horn of Africa Heritage. And as I mentioned, she's agreed to stand in at the very last moment. Sada, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. When Malcolm <coughs> called me on Monday evening, um, and he said there was this situation, I said yes, first, because uh, it was a chance to come to Scotland. I have, I've always wanted to come to Scotland. And uh, um, yes, thank you. I'm glad to be here. This is a short presentation that I put together for, um, for the last few days. And um, as Malcolm mentioned, I work with Somaliland Ministry of uh, Tourism and Culture. I set up the Department of um, Archaeology first in 2007 when I, went to, um, <coughs> when I went back for the first time in 16 years to my country after having become a refugee uh, in 1991 and ended up in Sweden. Um, and after that I came to the UK to study for my uh, PhD and uh, during that process I went back and I discovered that they had a lot of uh, archaeological heritage and they didn't have any um, department for cultural heritage or antiquity or archaeology and I also learned that I was the only Somali archaeologist so it was a when I presented this to Somaliland which is an unrecognized uh, country, but a de facto country which has its own international links with the, with, with the, with the international community and um, has in the last 20 years had a stable country, uh, peaceful uh, elections and trans, transfer, transfer of power. And um, it was it provided me with an opportunity to actually be in a safe part of the country where I could practice uh, my profession. And uh, the government was very happy, you know, when I presented my sur the results of my survey. And I said to them, yes, so what do we do? And they looked at me and they said, well, you do <laughs> what, what you're saying you want. To, you know. And I was just a PhD student, so I had only three months, so I started uh, building up a department, starting by actually um, hiring people. The criteria was to have the people who live closest to the sites to protect the sites. So it's basically um, getting the local people nearest to the site to recommend someone that they thought was, could take care of this site. So that's what we did all over Somaliland. And, um, in the five provinces and uh, by the time I left my first trip we had 40 people protecting 40 different sites or cluster of sites. Um, so that's the introduction to the context of my work. Um, people don't usually uh, know where Somaliland is. Somaliland is on the, um, on the Red Sea coast um, Somalia uh, and Somaliland are located in a strategic area which in the, in the past was a very important trade route, um, actual uh, cultural crossroads. Um, in the archaeology we can see uh, links with um, or trade, evidence of trade with ancient Egypt, um, civilizations in Persia, China, uh, hinterland Africa in Ethiopia and uh, the Swahili culture. We also have, a, as a result of these uh, long distance trade networks, um, communities on the coast and a multicultural society. And uh, in the Horn of Africa, it's uh, often called the cradle of humanity. And we have very long um, history in the sense of from you know, the studies of human evolution to the present history of um, the, the war and the, uh, the, the, the heritage of conflict. Um, but starting 
to, to work in this context, there were lots of challenges, as I said. For, to begin with, the country doesn't even exist. Um, um, it's not recognized, and um, there are other priorities, health, food security, infrastructure, and cultural heritage uh, and archaeology are not immediately available or um, um, prominent in any way. But uh, there was a goodwill, and as I said, the government gave me a free hand to, to do what I could do. And um, the problem then is the issues of, for example, when you want to build up a national heritage law and make use of international heritage law. And in Somaliland, we are in the situation very similar to what uh, Joanne said earlier in relation to the uh, ICH. Um, here we have Somalia, which never ratified the World Heritage Convention. And uh, Somaliland cannot do that because it's not, it's not uh, recognized. So this poses a problem. Um, but another interesting element to our culture is our important intangible heritage. Often, and until recently, we have only preserved our intangible heritage because this is something very important to us in terms of, um, in terms of uh, um, survival, in terms of living our daily life, in terms of uh, social and cultural interaction with the landscape um, and with each other. For us, oral history and oral transmission of skills have been paramount to our existence um, we have the poets in our culture have had the role of being the archives because they would keep, they will re um, learn all the poems accurately and actually they would be also at the same time opinion makers. So they would be coming to a village or a nomadic camp and they will collect all the poems that are supposed to be passed on to the big clan meeting to represent remote communities. So the communities would be, instead of writing a letter to their leaders, they would be composing a poem that would be recited by this professional poet who would then represent at the meeting. So they would be then represented. And this is just one way of how people have um, um, have this rich culture that is uh, very democratic and very uh, inclusive. Um, this is anthropologists who've studied this, have called it pastoral democracy. Uh, Johan Lewis is uh, actually one of the people who suggested this. Um, uh, he's uh, you know, one of the founders of Somali anthropology. And, um, Another thing is, when I went back, before, actually before I went back, when I, when I was studying archaeology, people said to me, you're a refugee, what do you do in studying archaeology? And I was living in Sweden studying uh, Scandinavian prehistory. And, um, and I really wanted to know what, what was my own past. And then I came to uh, London to study African archaeology. So was, and my BA dissertation was, what is heritage to Somali people? And I brought with me a, a catalog um, showing images of Somali objects. And I brought it to female uh, groups. And I said, hey, look at this. All oh, this is gone. We've lost all our heritage. The looting during the war, what do you think? Well, is this important to you? This heritage is gone. And they were completely indifferent. Um, and I was hoping that sense of loss, you know, to, to feel something. And when I started actually asking them, uh, what is your heritage? Uh, they started talking about the landscapes, uh, where they grew up, the things that they learned from their parents, um, their relationship with objects, their skills. And they actually looked again at the same document with the images of the objects. And they started talking about the objects in a completely different way, saying, I know how to make this. You can get the best raw material from that area. You use it at this time for that ritual, for this. So they were completely, ah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, a bit of nice music. Okay, so basically, this is the main thing is that um, their intangible heritage was also important to them, not because of just knowing about it, but actually when we were refugees, because we were living in a in a in a in the city of Mogadishu. I grew up there, and usually you would be sent off to go to the um, nomadic countryside to your grandparents to learn about um, how to fetch water, how to build a nomadic hut. And as a kid, we felt this is this is not very, you know. I really want to spend time watching TV with my friends. Uh, you know, this is my summer vacation. But when we became refugees all of a sudden, and we left our house with everything we had, TV, washing machine, all our comfortable things. The things that mattered were the things that, because actually we couldn't carry anything, we just had to run and walk and walk and walk and walk in order to escape violence, was what we had up here. Because initially, we didn't have any aid. So people were able to build their own nomadic huts, find, um, for example, uh, wells or uh, sorry, water sources. So they were able to actually do, um, to, to help themselves. Uh, and that is very key to that, uh, you know, having one foot in the country, one foot in the, uh, in the city, and making sure that this skills is there. And this is what I call a sort of um, a knowledge-centered approach. So they're not so much interested in the preservation of objects and monuments. And we know that in the 70s, for example, UNESCO's approach has been you know, a lot about monuments and museums. Now it's changing to become much more of what our people care about in terms of an anthropological dimensions to cultural heritage, uh, cultural landscapes, rituals. So I'm trying to use this uh, local approach to actually bring in the local people to talk about objects and monuments. Um, so this is one of the things that are guiding me. However, um, do we have potential world heritage sites? Because this is, uh, you know, the title of the conference is accessing world heritage sites. Well, because we haven't uh, got um, to, you know, to the point where we're able to sign or and ratify World Heritage Convention, what we have is potential World Heritage Sites. This is a 5,000-year-old uh, uh, rock-up site. Um, the only site that depicts sheep in, um, uh, in the Horn of Africa. Another site is this site, which also uh, depicts ancient uh, writing as well as pre-Islamic burials. The writing is Sabaean writing from um, sort of Red Sea cultures uh, associated with the Queen of Sheba uh, cultures and Solomon. And the, what we try to do is to, to get a lot of the information from this area in terms of oral history. So we do have heritage that needs to be preserved, but also that needs to be accessed. And this is uh, the rock art site of Last Girl. This is an um, extraordinary site. We have, 10 uh, panels uh, with paintings on one rock, and um, it's also 5,000 years old. And all of these sites are very uh, difficult to access. Um, uh, this site displays ancient calendar. Um, this other site is about uh, the beginning when we uh, first encountered Islam. This is one of the earliest mosques in sub-Saharan Africa. People say it has the oral history, uh, um, or the legend here is that pe Prophet's family fled uh, from the pagan culture of Arabia uh, when he had his revelation, and he sent them to go to Aksum to be protected by the, um, the Aksumite uh, Christianity, the other monotheistic religion. So on their way, uh, to Aksum. This is one of the first mosques that was set up. Um, so this, all of this uh, heritage um, we haven't been aware of because our heritage has been mainly intangible. And now we are discovering all of these elements. 
and accessing it's extremely difficult. Uh, in my surveys, um, one of the things that I struggle with is the infrastructure, but also landmines. Uh, so these sites are not secure. Um, we also have the problem due to the war that a lot of our people had to flee their country. Uh, people like me who are living in the diaspora. And they also need to access these sites uh, to learn about them, to preserve them. So a way, you know, we could use technology to um, digitalize these sites and have open access to this for many, many Somalis and also other people, but also for people who would like to go to these places, tourists who can't, to be able to actually uh, reach these places. And um, these places are, in terms of intangible heritage, this, the Islamic heritage is actually what we care about in general. The, the rock art and all of that is usually when I went there to do my survey, people would say, I would come with, a, with an album. I used to take pictures from different parts of the world, heritage from different parts of the world just to give them, um, to, to tell me what type of sites they knew from their area. I even had pictures of Stonehenge and say, have you seen anything, <laughs> you know, megalithic stone somewhere? And, and whenever they see the rock art, they would just jump and they say, are you looking for this? So you're looking for the devil's hole? Because for them, the paintings were associated with the devils. So these sites were not even visited. People did not want to know anything about them. They had all of these ideas about this, you know, if you, if you walk with your cattle, um, you should be walking from that side of the mountain, and if the, the cattle are pregnant, they will never bear offspring. So it was a whole different interaction with the landscape based on their beliefs. Um, so that's one element. But also now we have, you know, this is the main heritage that people have cared about, is the, the links with Islam, because that's the, his, the, the history that they know. And also you have the general destruction of the sites. Uh, here, this is a rock art site. People are very poor. They don't understand what rock art is. Here I came, someone was actually bulldozing this site. Um, it's a um, petroglyph 5,000 year old site. <laughs> it's one of our potential world heritage sites. Actually, as I was driving in, they, what they, these are poor people, and what they want to do is to take these stones, chop them into pieces, sell it to developers. They don't know what the rock art is. I have seen people build toilets with the most amazing rock art pieces. They don't know what it is. It's just a stone and they're using it. So I think using technology could be a way of uh, um, making, making use of this, um, this heritage, this knowledge that exists to bring it to a wider audience to help them. But um, also um, the nomads themselves one of the good things in our culture is that we may not have roads, we may not have hospitals, we may not have um, <laughs> industries, factories, but one thing that we have <laughs> good, uh, good knowledge of is IT. <laughs> and this, I think, is very much linked to our oral culture. We, we, only, we, we have selective approach to technology. We take the things that fit with our, you know, easy, if, you know, if you want to speak to someone, you, you, know, you call. Then you prioritize a phone. Uh, because that makes it easier for you to not, you have to walk for three uh, kilometers to, to visit someone. But also, this is one of my volunteers, and he's a camel herder. And he's got a smartphone, and he uses it to check how, you know, the, the livestock prices. <laughs> and, and this is the thing. We, we have actual resource here in terms of digital uh, digitalization to really use this for, um, uh, for making maybe apps so that people can download, but also build on this knowledge. I have actually had one ex uh, very bizarre experience myself. 
I was at the um, women's clinic, and uh, there was a lady who, all the women in Somalia, we, lately they were burqas um, because of the new influences, and she had lots of children's uh, maternity clinic, and she looked at me, and she was staring at me, and I was thinking, and she said, I know who you are. And then she dug into her bag and brought out this <laughs> fancy smartphone. And this is <laughs> in a village where you think there's absolutely nothing. And then all of a sudden I heard my voice. <laughs> and, and she was showing me because she had downloaded a whole um, uh, video uh, shown by CNN with me talking about sight. And she said, this is you. <laughs> so, so we haven't seen that. No, I, I can see that there is opportunity for this. But also I want to mention that there are a couple of uh, problems with this in terms of tourism. Because we, may, we don't have, you know, we, we, I really want to make the point that it can't replace tourism. Because one of the things that tourism does that I think are really key is to help people um, come, overcome, for example, prejudice, prejudices. I have traveled a lot and I have been challenged by people. Whenever I go to a new place, I have an image of what the people are going to be like. And when I actually get there, you know, I get a different experience. And that, for me, is very crucial. So it would be just a selected image that we would be putting on an app or whatever we do. Um, thank you.